Good morning, everybody. Welcome to St. Peter's Church. It's good to see you. Hopefully you've had a good weekend so far. If you'd like to stand with me, I believe we're going to read a psalm, or a portion of a psalm at least. So here we go, Psalm 25. O oh Lord, I give my life to you. I trust in you, my God. Do not let me be disgraced or let my enemies rejoice in my defeat. No one who trusts in you will ever be disgraced. But disgrace comes to those who try to deceive others. Show me the right path, O oh Lord. Point out the road for me to follow. Lead me by your truth and teach me. For you are the God who saves me. All day long I put my hope in you. Remember, O oh Lord, your compassion and unfailing love, which you have shown from long ages past. Let's worship together. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Anybody raise their hand in here who does not have breath? Okay, good. So that means we're all praising the Lord this morning. I like it. Here we go. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. With all of my heart, with all of my strength, with all that I have, yes, I will sing. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. There is a river. There is a river that flows unrestrained from your heart. Canyons of mercy, canyons of mercy, so deep I can never depart. Father, your wonders, Father, your wonders are endless. Open my eyes to believe, awake my soul. Let everything that has breath. With all that I have, I will sing. Let everything that I have breath praise the Lord. Yeah. We give you praise this morning, Lord. We thank you for your goodness to us. Morning by morning. We trust your goodness to see what the sovereignty does. Father, your wonders, Father, your wonders are endless. Open my eyes to believe, awake my soul. Let everything that I breath bring love. Yes, we pray. souls rejoice with thanksgiving with thanksgiving on our lips we answer your courts today all our lives we freely give awaken my soul to praise with thanksgiving with thanksgiving
forget everything that I pray. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. With all of my heart, with all of my strength, and all that I have, I will sing that everything that I pray. Praise the Lord. Oh, yes, we give you glory. Remind ourselves that you wonders us. Let's sing that verse one time. There is a river. There is a river. Fools are restrained from you. Canyons of mercy. Canyons of mercy. So deep I can never depart. Think of your wonders. we believe we believe in you Lord yes we believe you are savior of the world and lover of my soul
Riches I heed not. Riches I heed not. No man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance now and always. Thou and thou only the first in my heart. I King of heaven, my treasure thou my wife yesterday that I was like part part of my watch is broken and then she threatened me with making it last till Christmas but my first thought is one of two things can I fix it or does Amazon still have it and I think that's that's where we go can I fix it or does Amazon actually have the thing that I need what about the brokenness in our lives though I think we respond in different ways, or at least we're tempted to respond in different ways. Can I fix it myself? Can I ignore it? Or can God actually do something about it? And that's the stuff we wrestle with right now as we come to a time of confession, is to really uh, take our hearts outside of ourselves, that is our, our spirits outside of ourselves, and put them before the cross and say, God, can you actually do something about this? He desires to. He wants to. We're the ones that have to make the move here. And so let's uh, take a moment now and just let the Holy Spirit speak to our hearts, draw out the things that need to come before him, things that are broken that he needs to bring healing to. Now take a moment, and then we'll pray together. Spirit, the things that you've brought before our eyes may not even be a surprise to us. But don't stop telling us, Lord, that you want all of us. And that your canyons of mercy are bigger than what we see as unfixable, unhealable. So keep shouting to us, God how much of us you desire and help us to respond in kind. 
Would you pray with me this prayer of confession together? Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. Through your son, Jesus, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Uh, every morning, every night, do your best when that temptation comes to just fix it yourself or ignore it, to go to God with it and just let him keep doing his work, what only he can do. May, uh, may the peace of the Lord be always with you. Would y'all take a minute just to greet one another, pass the peace of Christ, and we'll call you back in just a minute. you all. Good morning. Uh, my name's Capers. I'm the executive pastor here at St. Peter's. Um, transparency is very important to us all here about everything that goes on and particularly in the area of our finances and how we steward uh, your resources that you provide, uh, God's resources that you provide to us here at the church. And so I wanted to invite my friend Deb Ohlendorf up here this morning um, Deb is a member of our board of stewards who helps steward all of these resources, and she is going to give us a brief financial update on the finances of the church. Thanks, Capers. Good morning. As Capers says, I'm Deb Ohlendorf, and I have had the privilege, and it's an honor, to be on the board of stewards for about a year now. And um, I just want to share a brief uh, mem moment to go over a little bit of, of the giving that we have had and, and what we have seen. So as you can see, our budgeted is the purple line and our actual is above that. And that is because of you all. And we couldn't do this work here in the church and local missions and missions across the world without your giving. So thank you so much for that. There are four ways of giving. As you may know, there's sending in a check there's doing the online giving, there's the app, and there's just dropping in the basket. And um, we appreciate the cash flow by the online giving and the app because that helps us to manage the budget, but we just appreciate all the giving that you have. So we should end the year on August 31st above budget, and that's amazing, and that's because of you. So we can continue to use the money that you give for God's glory and to further the gospel. I'd like to share something a little personal with you. Um, you may have struggled in your faith journey with the tithing thing. Okay, Lord, what do I do? How much? When? 10% of what number? All of that stuff. And I heard him say to me one day, do you trust me? Well, yes, I trust you. And then I heard him say to me, but do you trust me with your finances? Oh, that was a little bit of a struggle. And I wrestled with that. And I wrestled until I finally was able to come to the point and say, Lord, what do you want me to give? And that's where I felt joy because I was able to let go of everything and trust him even with my finances and say, what do you want me to give? And that's where the joy came in. And that's where I hope your journey will take you to. So thank you again for all that you give. It's a blessing to us. And um, we will use it 
to the best of our ability to further the mission. Thanks, Deb. And for those of you who call uh, St. Peter's your home, we're so grateful for you and everything you do. If you're just visiting, we're so glad that you're here. Um, if anyone, anyone ever has any questions about the finances and wants more details, we're open to providing that. Just let me know uh, if you have questions or AJ. Um, next, I just wanted to share with you all an update. I was on a mission trip to Honduras with a team from um, St. Peter's back in June, and I shared with you all when we returned that we were presented with this opportunity to help rebuild a home for someone who's greatly in need. Fanny is sitting, is in the picture here with her aunt. She lives with her aunt in Tegucigalpa. And Fanny has been very involved in the Lamb Institute ministry, which is the ministry that we support, and we visited down there. Um, in fact, her father, when she was young, died in a tragic incident, and it was his death that spurred on this um, ministry, which is called Youth in Action, which is to get kids off the street, um, kids that are in trouble off the street. And she's been very involved with that ever since. But she lives with her aunt, and this is a picture that was taken when we were down there from the interior of the, of the home. To say it's a modest home is an understatement. I mean, the, the, the walls were built from all different kind of materials, even some fiberboard was part of the walls. And they'd had so much rain down there that the house was in danger of collapsing. So we were asked by the folks at the Lamb Institute whether we could contribute to help rebuild the, the house. And because of your generosity and the money that we set aside for our mission partners in Honduras, we were able to pay for the reconstruction of the home, which was actually completed last week. And so this is a, these are pictures of them in the process of building it, rebuilding it, and then Fanny's aunt standing outside the newly constructed home, which will keep her um, dry and safe. So, again, thank you to everyone who gives to this church. This is one example of where your money goes to such great needs. So thank you again. And now let us continue in the worship with the reading of God's word. Our first reading is from Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 9 through 14. The Lord your God will make you abundantly prosperous in all the work of your hand, in the fruit of your womb, and in the fruit of your cattle, and in the fruit of your ground. For the Lord will again take delight in prospering you, as he took delight in your fathers. When you obey the voice of the Lord your God, to keep his commandments and statutes that are written in this book of the law, when you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. For this commandment that I command you today is not too hard for you, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend to heaven for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it. Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it. But the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you can do it. Our second reading is from Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, 
and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. The word of the Lord. I got to tell you, I, I, I just feel like the, the thing in my heart just to say as we begin is, is when we moved here a couple of years ago, you know, as Elaine and I were praying about moving back to the South, where we're both from, um, I said to the Lord, I want to be a part of a church that does stuff, doesn't just talk about stuff. And I would just say, like, two years in, this church does stuff, and it's amazing. There's so many things. That, y- y'all don't have the, the vantage point of where I sit, of getting pictures and emails and stories and testimonies of how this church does stuff. And if it's not in Honduras, then it's with a refugee family from Afghanistan. If it's not there, then it's in Haiti. If it's not there, then it's just even the ways in which this church is the church to each other. Like the amount of people in our church right now that I know have just been diagnosed with cancer. And without it being programmed, hey, you should go love that person. It's just happening. That's a church that does stuff, that is the church. And I just want to name that and to say because of that, I think the Holy Spirit longs to dwell here and is pleased to dwell here. And so I'm just really grateful. It's a, it's a privilege to be a pastor here. Um, so anyways, that wasn't in the notes. Um, I'm so pumped. Tomorrow, I get to go with 37 people from our church to Israel. So we've been, we've been waiting on this learning trip for a while. Every single year, like one of the things we want to do is not just have a global perspective when it comes to loving the world, but also a global perspective when it comes to learning the gospel. And so every year, we hope to have a learning trip somewhere in the world where we can walk the past of the church, the ways of Jesus, so that we can live them out in our time. So anyways, if you are on that trip, would you just stand? I just want to see if you're in this room. A few of y'all are here that are going to be on this. We want to pray for you. And uh, the way we want to pray for you is to say something that we're going to be saying together. We're all going to join into this symphony. So pinkies in the air. This is something we will do twice a day. So you can pray for us. And we will pray the Shema next screen, if you will. And it says this. This is the most famous passage in all the scripture. And let's just say it together. If you can't pronounce it, it's okay. None of us can. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Achad. And what it is is, hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. We pray for you. So excited to be on this trip with you guys. Um, that is a, an amazing way to begin the day. The Jews pray it three times a day, and it is just an incredible way to think about what it means to follow God, to be a God follower in this world. And I say that because this last part, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself, in the first century, that was a fierce debate. And, you know, we kind of go through it. Yeah, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. You should love your neighbor as yourself. Isn't that sweet? Say it before bed. Isn't that nice? No, no, no. That was a debate in the first century. That was controversial because the question inevitably came up, and it still does today, who is my neighbor? Who qualifies for that? Who's my neighbor? People I know, people I like, people I agree with. Who is my neighbor, Jesus? People that, assi- that sort of a, are on the same tribal sort of landscape with me that see politics the way I see it, that see the world the way I see it, that see ec- economics the way I see it. Is that my neighbor? That's the question that has been raging in the world since before the time of Jesus, certainly during and even now. From the text in Luke, this is the question that the man has the Pharisee professor in Jewish law. Don't think of him as the Lincoln lawyer, not that kind of law. Think of him as a Pharisee professor. And what is he trying to do? Next passage. Uh, Keep going and keep going. He says this, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And go to the bottom here if it says, where is it? But 29, but wanting to justify himself. Anyone ever been there? I mean, you can catch that. It's what makes Christianity so unique that we don't justify ourselves. I mean, how much of life and energy do we spend trying to justify ourselves, trying to prove ourselves, trying to earn something, trying to be worthwhile as a human being, trying to get respect, trying to justify himself? The uniqueness of Christianity is that we are justified by Christ 
in his work. We are imparted identity, everything that we need to be fully human. And he says at the end, and who is my neighbor? Now you can back up to that last, that last part that, that we just came from. Those of us on, in the Western world, that's us, we are descendants of Greek learning. That's not a problem. I love the classics. There's tons to glean from. And I'm grateful for the ways it's created our society. But the Greek way of thinking is around ideas. It's around concepts. It's around theories. It's abstract. We learn an abstraction. The Hebrew way of learning is so very different. They learn through images. So if you were to ask someone of the Hebrew mindset, what is the purpose of spirituality? A Hebrew learner might take a balloon and say, let me show you. The, key, the process of learning, the process of spirituality might look something like this. That to love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and all of your strength is to mean that spirituality is designed to expand yourself before a holy God. That's the meaning. A Hebrew teacher would say, let me show you what it means to follow God. Following the one true God looks a little like this. Certainly not like this. Certainly not diminished. Certainly not shrunk. They might quote Deuteronomy 30, saying, When you obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes that are written in his book of the law, when you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength, that following God is designed to expand us from within. It's no wonder that the Spirit of God is called wind. Because when the winds of God come in your life, it's like a balloon. They're designed to grow you. It's designed to expand who you are. That's how following God is supposed to be. I'm not sure that's how the world would describe Christians at this moment. As expansive people of possibility, curiosity, imagination, and grace. Deuteronomy 30 verse 11. For this commandment that I command you today, it's not too hard for you. Neither is it far off. In other words, it's not out there. You're not waiting to find God out there and go on a big journey. It's actually closer than you think. Learning to find God, it's not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend to heaven and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it. Neither is it beyond the sea. This is a very Greek way of thinking, that you should say, who will go for the sea for us and bring it to us, that we may hear and do it. But the word is very near you. It is in your mouth. It is in your heart. So you can do it. And I love this idea in the new covenant, in the Holy Spirit, because of Christ and what has been sent to us to indwell our bodies, that we have everything we need to be fully human. And that does not mean life is easy. That is not the promise we're given. But in the midst of that, God is here and is powerful and is with us in whatever season that we are in. And you can live it. You can do it. You can endure and you can flourish. Show of hands, how many of you have heard the parable of the Good Samaritan? This is perhaps the easiest story to hear and the hardest story to live. The teaching Jesus gives us in this parable is very, very difficult. The story of this man's unwillingness to expand his understanding, years of studying Jewish law, diminished spiritual life. Isn't that interesting how that works sometimes? This parable, I want to suggest, is more relevant right now than it's ever been before in human history. And if you think you know it, what I want to invite you to do is to listen again, because perhaps there's something you've missed along the way. At least there was for me this week as I dove back into this text. Here we go. Verse, chapter 10 of Luke, starting in verse 25, on one occasion, an expert of the law, he stood up to test Jesus. Now, that's interesting because that's very Jewish, that you would test your teachers, you would test your rabbis, you would see what they know, you would watch how they live. And this Jewish pharisaical PhD law professor says, teacher, he asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What's written in the law, he replied, a question with a question, very Jewish. How do you read it? And so the Jewish law PhD guy says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. So this would have been extremely a part of the fabric of the society. Praying the Shema, which what does that mean? The pinky in the air. It means that there's more strength in the finger of God than there is in all of the might of Pharaoh. That God can deliver us in whatever situation that we are in. And love your neighbor as yourself. 
The first part of this verse comes from Deuteronomy. The second part comes from Leviticus. It's a mashup called the Shema, and the Jews still pray it three times a day. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. Do this, and you'll live. Wow. Like, the man could have stopped here, right? Had a nice, quiet evening back at home. Fire up the Traeger. Would have been great. But no, he didn't stop there. But he wanted to justify himself. There were no Traegers back then, by the way. And so he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? So here's what Jesus does. He pulls out of his pocket a dictionary and gives him an abstract definition about who the... No, 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 that's not what he does. He tells him a story. Why does he tell him a story? Because definitions are easy to forget, but stories never leave your soul. They're easy to remember. You can't forget a story. Verse 30. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down to Jerusalem, from Jerusalem, rather, to Jericho, when he was attacked by robbers. Okay, I want you to see it. Next picture. This is it. This is the actual place. When he's telling the story, he actually puts it in an actual historic context. If you were to do this path today from Jerusalem to Jericho, this is the same trail that you would take if you were to walk, and you can walk it even today. This is not exactly the IOP connector. There are challenges all over this trail of food, of water, of safety. It is an 18-mile stretch from Jerusalem to the Dead Sea, and this road was essential to the spice trade. So it wasn't like a road. You see it here. It wasn't like no one ever traveled it. It's that you traveled it if you wanted to make money, but you would also travel it if you were a priest. And the reason why is because Jericho is like the cashiers or the highlands of that time. It was the retreat place. You would go from Jerusalem in your craft to Jericho. It was an oasis beach town, right, by the Dead Sea. Lots of wealth amassed from the priests at this time. So it was a vacation outing that they would be going on. And so you can imagine if you have traders on this in the spice trade and you have wealthy priests, that it would attract all sorts of robbers to this road and have all sorts of potential dangers. By the way, you would walk this. There are no Broncos at this time was not happening. So it's not surprising that Jesus would include a priest in this story. That wouldn't have been out of place. So here comes the text. They, meaning the robbers, they stripped him of this man's clothes. They beat him and they went away, leaving him half dead. Now remember, let's not lose the plot. The plot is who's my neighbor? What am I supposed to do toward the world? Who, who qualifies for that for me? That's the question that Jesus wants to answer here through the story. So he, they leave him half dead. And what that means is basically he's ceremonially unclean. And that's a problem for priests. No priest is going to touch a dead body, at least a half dead body. Verse 31, a priest happens to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, what does he do? He passes by him. And so too a Levite, when they came to the place where they saw him, they passed by the other side. This man is half dead. And before we get all self-righteous, like, well, I would have helped the guy. Listen, they are doing what they thought the law required. These are not bad people. These are just people that have, have, have shrunk in their imagination to only do the minimum standard and have not seen the larger story of what God is doing in humanity. And so they have this tough choice to make. Do I ceremonially become unclean and help this half-dead guy who probably won't survive anyway? I would imagine that would have been my rational. Or do I actually become unclean and help this guy? That's a tough choice. Now, the context underneath it, there are three types of people that would have walked this road from the sort of priestly line that we need to know about. I won't go into detail, but I'll just say this. Priests, and what would they do? They would perform the ceremonies in the temple. Levites, who would serve the priests in the temple. Now, all priests were Levites, not all Levites were priests. The big category was the tribe of Levi. Within that, priests could be eligible for actual candidacy in the temple. So Levites and priests would have gone together. They both would have, that's why Jesus brings him up, both priests and Levites, neither of them would have wanted to touch the man because of ceremonial purposes. And then there's a third type of person who also serves the temple, and those are called laymen. Laymen could help the Levites. They could be from any tribe. So you have priests, you have Levites, you have laymen. That would have been sort of like there was a priest, an imam, and a rabbi walking down the road, right? That would have been sort of the joke. It would have been priests, Levites, laymen. So when Jesus says there was a priest walking down the road, there was a Levite down the road, he is expecting them to assume that the next person he is going to bring up is the layman. That would have been what was going on in their heads to say, okay, here comes the layman. Let's see what he does. The lawyer's question 
about who is my neighbor to Jesus was designed to be a curveball. It wasn't like an honest inquiry. He's trying to trap him. But Jesus throws curveballs better than Sandy Koufax. To toss in a Samaritan in the story was a plot twist. Next slide. More profound than Luke Skywalker learning that his father was Darth Vader. (laughs) It would have been totally unexpected to be like, no, 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 no. The layman is who you're supposed to put in the story. Not that guy, not the Samaritan. Why would we even bring him up? It is, it is hard to overstate the racial hatred between Jews and Samaritans. Next part of the text. But a Samaritan, Jesus says, as he traveled down that road, he came to where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. And he went to him, and he bandaged his wounds, and he pouring out oil and wine. And then he put the man on his own donkey, and he brought him to the inn and took care of him. And then the next day, he took out two denarii, and he gave it to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for extra expenses that you may have. Let's go to the maps, shall we? We like to go to the maps here. If we go to the map, a typical year in the life of someone following Jesus in the Sea of Galilee meant that you would go to Jerusalem at least three times for the festivals. And this would be your most direct path from the Galilee all the way down to Jerusalem. You can see Samaria and the dotted area right there. That would have been the most direct path. Now remember you're walking. And so if you're walking, you want a path that, you know, doesn't have a lot of, you know, robbers, which that would not have had. And also the most direct path. That would not have been the path that Jews would have taken at this time. Instead, They would, next slide, go all the way around to the other side of the Jordan and through Jericho and finally up to Jerusalem. Out of their way by miles, dozens of miles, walking in the desert. Why? Because they hate Samaritans. And Samaritans hate them. They would avoid each other at all costs. In fact, they wouldn't even speak. Remember that passage where Jesus meets the Jewish or the Samaritan woman at the well. Massive controversy. Jews and Samaritans had this long and bitter history. In Harry Potter language, Samaritans were mudbloods. They were like half Jewish, half pagan. And long before this time, they intermarried with the Syrians and they forged a kind of Jewish pagan mix, a sort of mashup of religion. And so Jews hated them. And they claimed to have their own temple in Samaria. It was, it was bad. Verse, thir- verse 36. Which of these three do you think was the neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert of the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. Now, I grew up with the perspective of, okay, so to be a good neighbor, I need to love people that are in need. Yes, but it's deeper than that. It's more difficult than that. The point of the story isn't to love those who are in need, though we want to do that. It certainly would be included. He's saying that the people you hate most are actually the hero of this story. And that guy is your neighbor. Do you have any mercy for him? Who's having mercy for him? The story is calling us to expand like a balloon to permit the Holy Spirit to fill you so much that all there's left room for is love. That that's what fills you. Quoting another person, Tim Keller recently retweeted something that I think that bears repeating. This quote said, how you treat the people you like and want to defend tells me nothing about your Christian faith. How you treat those you do not like and think are a problem tells me so much more about your Christian faith. Well, that's annoying. (laughs) Who's your enemy? (sighs) Jesus says, that's your neighbor. Some might say, the enemy is this guy. Others might say, the enemy is this guy. Some today say, the enemy is this woman. Others today say, no, 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 it's that woman. 
Others say that my blood pressure goes way high when I see these symbols, one of them. <laughs> I, I think all of these examples about the enemy, though, like, they're just too easy. They get us off the hook. Like, political leaders we don't have any engagement with on a daily basis. That's too easy to say, yeah, I need to learn to love this person, this political, whatever, whatever. Yeah, sure, that's great. But I think this text wants to hit us closer to home about something daily that's happening in our life. Some of you are like, please get that off the screen. <laughs> I want you to think about that map I showed you a few minutes ago about that detour. You know, those people. Let's go around them. Who do you detour? Have you ever taken a detour to avoid someone? I have. Have you ever taken a detour in the church to avoid somebody? Have you ever taken a detour in the office or in your neighborhood? Have you ever taken a detour around your extended family around a holiday? <laughs> I get it. Have you ever wanted to block a call or ignore a text from that person? We all do. Like following Jesus is really hard. I think many are attracted to the notion of salvation, but fewer are attracted to discipleship, to formation. See, God always loves us where we are, but is always calling us into something more. Your neighbor is the person right now that you least want to intersect with in daily life. And I'm not talking about an abuser. Like, that's a different category. That's a different thing. Safety is necessary. Leaving that behind is necessary. I'm talking more about an annoyer. That thing that kind of emotionally grinds on you over time and just puts you in a spirit of cynicism and fighting with that person in the shower and they're not even there. Let's hope they aren't. That would be weird. <laughs> a few years back, I was... Um, I was really, Martin, if you want to come up and just underscore and, and sing over us, my brother. Um, a few years back, I was really struggling in a work relationship with a colleague. And it was just like, it was so emotionally taxing. Just like the inner monologue and playing out the scenario and revisiting the, the weirdness and the tension. And it was really hard. I just remember it like grinding me down. Every morning I would get up to read the scripture and it would just flood my head. That relationship. And some of you are, you know what I'm talking about. Like you just, any free space you get, you're just like, I'm going to play Sudoku because I'm just dying in my head, right? You're just kind of reliving these tapes over and over. And um, I remember I would process it with my mentor. His name's Ed. And I'd call Ed and I'd be like, hey, this is what I'm going through. Give me some wisdom here. And, um, and I just got to a place in my life where I just, I didn't have any energy. I was just, I was just done. I was done. And um, I wasn't expanding. I felt like I was diminishing and shriveling in my heart. And it wasn't growing with love and mercy. It was growing with self-righteousness and the need to be right. You know? And some people really feed off conflict. And when you have someone like that in your life, it's really hard to get out of that chaos. And that's what I felt like I was in. And, um, and he said something to me I'll never forget. I was walking this little trail and... Um, and he said, he said, AJ, thanks for sharing this with me. I, I just have a word for you. And I said, yeah, come on, I need, I need a word. And he said, do you not realize without Saul, there would be no David? Every person needs a Saul in their life. And what you do with that will either make you angry or it'll make you holy. Your choice. I'm not kidding. I went like this and just wept. I felt like the Lord was just like, that's, that, that's me speaking to you through this vessel. Listen to him because I will make you holy if you will allow it to convert from anger into mercy. 
because everyone's carrying a heavy load. Have mercy. What if the enemy in our life is never other people? Oh, you have an, an enemy. Scripture says it's against principalities and powers, not flesh and blood. But God uses all of the ingredients of life to shape us. Will you let it? Will you grow into mercy? Or will you shrivel in bitterness? Can you ask God for mercy this morning for yourself in order to expand? That like a balloon, the love of God would fill every part of who you are. That you don't need to be right anymore. You don't need them to be wrong. You don't need them to say sorry. Because you have an identity from Christ who justifies you, not yourself. He has justified you and given you a beloved identity that you don't need anything from anyone because he gives you everything you need. And so you are free to love. Let's sit into that for a second before we come to this table because Jesus modeled it out right here and said, eat this as a metaphor that I am filling you with everything you need. You lack nothing for the journey. Holy Spirit, I pray for myself and my friends, for your church, that we would be a different kind of people, that we would be a Jesus people, a people who refuse to be enemies, people that have strength to love. God, get us out of the binary systems of the world of winners and losers. And let us live freely in you where we can bless even those who curse us. And we speak your victory over the enemy of Satan and the demonic that has triumphed over that and will in the end lead to victory in all the earth. We sit and wait for you. Speak to us in this moment, Jesus. Amen. There is a river that flows up. So with my soul. It's in the presence of God that our understanding moves from heart or head to heart. And so we can't Come with low expectations or no expectations into his presence. Let's keep coming with very, very high expectations, including high expectations of ourselves that we're open. And that though we may not understand yet with our heads, that when it connects to the heart, it makes all the sense in the world. And so we recognize the presence of the Lord this morning. The Lord is here. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, 
saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so, Holy Spirit, thank you. Thank you that you do not desire to leave us or forsake us. You desire to show us more and more of who you are and who we are in you. And thank you for making spiritually this bread and this and this wine your your body and your blood because you know that it nourishes our soul. Thank you for every good gift which come from, comes from you in Jesus' name. Amen. And so we say, uh, as the world, the global church says every single day in every single way, that Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. It's called a mystery of faith for a reason. It's something for us to keep exploring, even with our hearts as well. Would you stand as you're able? And we'll say our family prayer together. And saying, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. I want to invite our servers forward. As they come forward, remember that um, we do have gluten-free elements, so you can um, ask for those um, if you are in need. Come expectant this morning. Come remembering that Christ has a plan for your life. But being that it takes two to tango, we have to be full recipients of it. We are the body of Christ. Let's live into that this morning.
It's so good to be here today together. I pray that this day or tomorrow morning that you might find space to create space, to breathe in deep, to know the love of God and to be the love of Jesus in this world. So friends, as we say every single week, let us go forth in the name of Christ. Grace and peace.